How can I truly be happy? How can I be happy? How can we be happy? Isn't that our desire? Right? It's, it's, it's really the mantra or the desire of humanity. It is. We pursue happiness. No one really pursues sadness. If you, if you pursue, well, I'm sure there's moments where we can if we have a, you know, an, a, a mental issue, right? Something's maybe chemically imbalanced or even demonically oppressed in some cases. So God put this longing in us to be happy, every single one of us. Even our, our country's founding document expresses this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But even the American dream that we are, you know, we're kind of raised in that. You, your goal maybe as when you're growing up is when you get a career and have a place and have a family and maybe, a, you know, a white picket fence and a dog and a, a, a good, you know, I don't know, an American car in the driveway or something. Like that. Uh, that classic American dream image, it, it doesn't answer the question that God has placed in our hearts. And he placed it there to lead us to him. In fact, that's why you're here this morning. That's why I'm here. If we were totally fulfilled to the brim perfectly, we would have no need. True life, freedom, and happiness are found in the one who designed them, created them, and we need only look to the words of Scripture to find them. So if you, look, if you look up happiness in any thesaurus, it's interesting because you'll see one of the synonyms is beatitude. And that ties us right into scripture. It's the state of blessedness. It's happiness from the word of God. The Psalms, where we're going to start today, were central to Israel's daily life. Central to their worship. They, they pointed to Jesus a long time before he was ever on earth. And then Jesus Christ himself, he lived out these psalms in the flesh while he walked the earth. Because he is, was, and always will be the blessed one himself. And he teaches us how to be a blessed people. How to be a truly happy people. Because that's the reason you're here, is to be happy. It's hard for us to think like that because of the, what the word happiness means to us. Right? We find happiness in a lot of other things. Um, happiness could be a sugar rush. I don't know. That's not biblical happiness. So Jesus' first sermon in Matthew 5 begins with this word, for blessed. And so do the first five, first of the five books of Psalms. The Psalms are divided into five books, kind of, we think, associated to the, the Torah and all that. And we just have it in one book. Both teachings, the Beatitudes in the New Testament and in the Psalms and really throughout Scripture, answer this question that we viciously try to answer on our own, how can I be happy? So we'll start in Psalm 1 today. If you have your Bibles, turn there. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. The Hebrew word for blessed, the Asherah means just a state of happiness. State of happiness in God's favor. It's not fleeting, it's a state, a, a, a constant state of happiness. That, that, sounds, that sounds exciting. That sounds like something people need to hear in the day that we live. That sounds like something people need next week. A constant state of happiness. How, how, what, what can we do to enter into this state? What, can we, what, what path do we take? What, what books do we read? What a person do we follow on whatever social networks you follow? What's the secret? 
Well, as we're reading the Bible, the psalmist, and this is an unknown writer for this psalm, rather than immediately telling us what to do, he's going to tell us what not to do. So that's where we'll start this morning. What not to do. All around us are constant distractions. How many of you are just tired of constant distractions, right? Just, it's like, man, these, these, you just take your whatever phone, if you have a smartphone, and you just want to like throw the thing out the window. (laughs) Because it's like assaulting us with interruptions constantly. There's other things, there's temptations uh, to pull us away from this blessed state that God wants us in this morning, that he promises to us in his word, and then he tells us how to get there. These things that pull us away, they, they seem like, they seem right sometimes. And Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. So all other things for this happiness are, are going to bring death, and only one way brings life. Now, it sounds absolute, but... It's, it's either or. If, if you're going to say, you can either say yes to God and his ways for your life, which includes this state of blessedness, or you can choose another way. And in our day, there is a temptation to fall in between, as if there's this like gray area you can kind of float around, but the Bible's pretty clear it's either or. And how we get to one place or the other is through our choices. So right away, the psalm is dealing with our choices in our hearts. And in our choices, we have our position. So when we don't listen to wicked counsel, stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. Now, to walk with sinners or stand or sit with scoffers, wicked people, that does not mean that, well, okay, this is what the Bible says. So I am, I'm going to avoid all sinners at all times. I'm never going to sit at the table with a sinner. And um, I'm not going to walk like near someone who I know is wicked. And I'm not going to listen to anybody who speaks anything evil. You can listen without accepting instruction. So you can walk without being influenced. And you can sit without being comfortable in the same thing that the evil influence or person is in. Because if that was the case, and this is what the Pharisees did, Jesus ate with sinners. Jesus touched unclean lepers. And the Pharisees were good at doing what a lot of we, uh, us as Christians do today. We'll take it to the extreme, and we use the, the pride of saying, well, no, this is the word of God. It says that, so I'm going to do it. It says, don't sit with scoffers, so I'm not going to sit that's, that's why we have teachers, and that's why we study, and, and we read in context and things like that. The Pharisees took it to the extreme, and they looked at Jesus as a defiled man who ate with sinners and was dirty because of it, and healed on the Sabbath and did all these things. But the reality is it comes down to our heart. It, it means simply not being instructed by ungodly guidance, which is pulling at every single one of us any given day. Not following sinful ways, not actually doing them, walking in them. These are illustrative. This is also poetic language. So remember what kind of book you're reading when you're in the Bible. The genre. And then not sitting, which relates to dwelling in the wrong places, whether in your mind or just being comfortable where you're at spiritually, when God wants you somewhere else. Scoffers refuse instruction. Sinners continue just being, uh, you know, a sinner by title, and you, you have that, oh, I'm, I'm going to stay you know, a sinner. That means someone who's just going to keep going the wrong way, and then the wicked is just generally anybody who's, you know, doing things against God. So it's where we position ourselves, where we choose to position ourselves in our hearts every day. Ancient Israel, the Jews, they taught, they taught their, their children verses like these. Um, and that, that getting into position every single day. Which really, it, this goes back to Deuteronomy 6, 4, the great Shema. And 
you see the, I don't know if I, yeah, I did, I put it up there. So, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. There, Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. The purpose of that is to prevent them from going astray. To keep them walking in the ways of God when all the idolatry was around them and all these ungodly nations. Everywhere we turn, there's a pull to position ourselves away from God and his influence and his instruction. And when we do that, we turn from the instruction that's found in the word and we start subtly, very gradually, accepting instruction that is not of God. And we're leading to sinful instruction, to evil instruction. And it's so subtle. Um, I, think it was, I think it was Steve Hill who said, like, you don't just go off and do some crazy sin all at once, right? You, you kind of dip your foot in the water like you're near a pool, and then you get used to the temperature. That takes a while. It's kind of like that with our subtle decisions of where we position ourselves each and every day. So we create our own forms of happiness. We are good at creating our own forms of happiness. They are forms of happiness. They're not biblical, godly happiness. A new car. That's a temporary happiness. A new device. Ugh. A new job. I'm sure, that sounds good. Or, or, or how about within yourself? Many, many philosophies will tell you that you can find happiness if you just get in touch with yourself. If you just... Center on your own goodness, okay? Now, I'm not, not entirely against centering your focus because that's, that actually has biblical roots, but we'll get into that. Um, you're not going to find happiness. You're not going to find happiness in winning the game, even though I was bummed, you know. I, I went to pick up my daughter from the, the Spencer game last night, and she told me, she told me that you guys lost. Am I, am I right? Okay, I'm sorry. But there, it was quiet. It was kind of disappointing. Um, I wasn't actually at the game, but she was. But that's a temporary happiness of winning the game. And it's not necessarily bad. But your, your state of blessedness is not found in that. Your state of blessedness, hear me out, it's not found in the results of the election next week. That's not going to determine your, your state of happiness. It's also temporary. So don't allow the world, a lot of it is media that we've created, ironically, to instruct you on where to find your fulfillment and don't stand in the way that leads to death or get so comfortable that you can sit and, and feel okay not having God as your only source of happiness. And it, it, it should be not okay in my life or our lives in general to not, not be thinking about God as, as much as we should, Right? It, it, this is a hard thing you have to analyze and, and, and get inside your heart to, to realize how not great it is, but how much work it needs and how much help we all need every single day. And here's what we have to do because we have to answer that question. Number one, we have to delight in the law. Psalm 1-2 says, but his delight, and of course this is that term, you know, it's saying his, but we're talking about male and female. Um, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Delight in law? Uh, on the surface, that doesn't really sound exciting to me. I, you want me to get excited over, over a bunch of laws. The word for law here means instruction, and the Hebrew word is the Torah. The Jews define the Torah as the first five books of the Bible. Here it's used, and here's how we, we if I use it today at all again, I'm not referring to just the five books. I'm re referring to the, the canonized scripture. That, that's our instruction now. We have the, the full revelation, right? Up to that last word in revelation. So following God's instructions or Torah leads to true happiness. So still, having an argument with myself, so following a bunch of rules, still, following a bunch of instructions, how can you find true happiness in that? Because, I don't know, that sounds like maybe legalism. Well, this shouldn't surprise you that following instructions 
gives you some sort of fulfillment because that also is inside of you. It's built in. When you want to accomplish something, let's say uh, you, you wanna, your goal is to change the oil on your car. You're going to do it yourself. You're going to save a whole $15 and you're going <laughs> to do it yourself. Because, yeah, it's expensive. You're gonna cha- you might as well just go get a change somewhere else. Um, you're, you have a, a, a task to accomplish and you are going to seek out instruction on how to do so. Most of us are going to go to a great big platform that's really good at providing instruction. YouTube, right? Our media center world is obsessed with how-to videos and, and, and instruction, and YouTube is the highest profiting uh, video network there is, and how-to videos rank up there, I think, in the top five, last I checked. So we'll spend countless hours seeking out instruction. So you're, you're getting this oil change, you have to accomplish your goal, and you do what it takes to seek it out, and the oil is changed, the oil pan bolt is torqued properly, those who are laughing are laughing because they never torque that thing. They just use, they, they know what torque is. Um, when it's done, you're good. You have no need for that instruction anymore. If you have even a, a decent memory, you're probably going to remember. And if not, maybe you'll turn to it again. But you're not going to read it every day. You accomplish your goal. You're done with it. It's, it's, it's like the Lego sets that I have in my house. I build them with my kids. Well, they're getting older now. They can help me. Actually, they're really good. I can, I, I can leave them, but I, I like it. It's... It's, it's therapeutic for me. When we're done, we probably have a box of Lego instruction manuals. We're never going to use them again. <laughs> what are we going to try to find all the pieces that are all, all over, mixed up somewhere? I mean, that, that's madness. So we use it once and we're done. It's fulfilled. So we seek out instruction. We do it every day. With God, why, if this is his instruction manual for our lives, why would we lay it down unless somehow in our minds the idea has crept in that, well, we're good. We're done with our task. We've arrived. Last I checked, nobody has perfectly followed this instruction manual and fulfilled it except Jesus Christ. And he showed us how to do it. And that's why he didn't abolish the law. Matthew 5, 17, do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So you can say, delighting in the word, in the Torah, in the scriptures, in the Bible, in his instructions is delighting in Jesus. Delighting in the word is delighting in Jesus. All the law and prophets point to and are fulfilled in him. So how do we end up not delighting in his words? The Psalms answer that. The Bible answers that. Like I said today, we have more distractions than ancient Israel did. But they had distractions too. And they memorized, they sang daily these, these psalms to focus on God's will. If they struggled with memory back then, thousands of years ago, I think we also would probably need extreme help in that area. We, we created machines to help us remember. Not necessarily to our benefit. Because when you take away what you're depending on for memory, you're left to mem- remember on your own, and that is much more difficult. But, of course, we, we've made things easier. They had to keep him on their minds and hearts, not just on the Sabbath day, but every single day. And then, well, we could say, well, yeah, but it's written on our hearts. Now, his law is written on our hearts. We don't have to, uh, maybe we don't have to be so disciplined. And because of that, that attitude in our hearts, our priorities have been mixed, mixed up, and now we have a problem because we thought this was an autopilot thing when it's actually a constant direction thing for our hearts. Right? It's like those, the big ships like the Navy has, they have some kind of autopilot system in there, right? We don't have that. We have to manually be interacting with our hearts on a daily basis, spiritually. And I'll prove it with an example of how our priorities are. Now, you don't have to answer, of course. What if I said next week, this is the challenge next week, no one is going to watch any news 
I already lost everybody right there. Most people. <laughs> We're just going to read our Bibles. No media. No phones. We're going to pray and we're going to read our Bible. And then we'll meet next, next week and see what happens. Of course, I'm not, I, I wouldn't expect you to do that. I wouldn't expect myself to do that. But why? Why? That's something we have to answer this morning in our hearts. Maybe because we just have to. Maybe because the word isn't the delight as much as it should be. So how do we get there? We're getting there because delight is tied to the word for meditate, the Haggah in the Hebrew, and it means to mutter first, like a pigeon making that noise. It's associated with that. A read in an undertone, to ponder, to talk to oneself, which I do a lot. You guys talk to yourselves? Okay, you should because the Bible says so. We're talking about meditating, speaking and proclaiming. So it's not emptying our minds like in the Eastern way of meditation, to completely empty yourself and then find some enlightenment. Like I said, there, now there is, there's, there's nothing wrong with having quiet moments of silence because we need that. And even therapeutically, there is a, a centering that's not associated with Eastern stuff. It's just, it's simple. You're just going to be present and be aware. But the issue is this. That silent moment in your mind when all the noise is gone, it doesn't last forever. It, something is going to come back. So biblical meditation is redirecting our minds in, into and onto and with his words. And studies prove we learn much better, we retain much better if we are reading out loud, speaking while we're reading. It's, you know, you're just getting two ways. Or listening and then you know, reciting and things like that. God, God designed it that way. And there's something about speaking that is powerful. We know this from the scripture. This is nothing new to most of you. When we speak the word of God, there's power. Saying it out loud. Jesus, when he was tempted in the wilderness, and, and Satan comes along and he's using scripture to twist and attempt to make Jesus fail. Jesus didn't sit silently and say, okay, I have the word stored in my heart. I'm not going to say anything to this guy. I just don't. No, he spoke. And he spoke the word of God in context. And that was powerful. And Satan had to flee. He doesn't like hearing the word of God. It reminds him of his destiny. The New Testament also directs us to speak to one another in multiple places, but um, Ephesians 5.19, that we are addressing uh, one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, which actually means songs based in the spirit of God from the word of God. Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Maybe greet somebody with a song, a psalm this morning. It would feel kind of weird, maybe. I don't know. But for many, that's not the desire of our hearts. And that means when it's not the desire of your heart, when this is just, uh, it's a chore. It's a struggle, right? To get into the, I just can't get into the word. Oh, Leviticus. Um, when that desire of our hearts is, is not there, like thinking, okay, something's wrong. When I do not hear from one of my kids for a while, even within the house, if I'm the one there, per, if there's quiet, something's, I haven't heard from them in a while, right? If you go a few days without seeing someone at your job, here, let's use a church example. A few weeks go by and you don't see that person in church service. What's the tendency? Come on, church people. That they've gone somewhere else or that something happened and our minds go down all kinds of crazy ways. Or maybe that's just me. I don't know. This is what happens when you don't hear from God. And none of us is so spiritual that we just, we wake up and oh, the heavens open up and all the words of God just are downloaded into us before we pick up our phone and check the weather in the news or ask the smart speaker. I just want to throw them out the window, honey, the smart speakers. I mean, do we need smart speakers? Let's make a decision here, guys. No, let's, sorry. We're talking to devices. Those of you like me who were raised in like the 80s or before, I mean, come on, what is happening? So when we don't hear from something, it makes us, we, we're not, we're not going to, Everything's not okay. So not having the desire to, to seek after God in his word, it's a, it's a symptom of spiritual sickness. Now, 
You could choose to be offended that I'm saying that to you this morning. But it happens to all of us at some point in our walks because it's a daily walk. It's a daily process. When you start losing that desire and thinking that you're okay functioning and just living a full life without the instructions of God, it's a sign of spiritual sickness. It's a sign that there's maintenance, preventative maintenance in your life that needs to be taken care of. This is literally from this morning. This light has been annoying me for the past two weeks, over and over. It's bad enough it has to command me to put on a seatbelt. I can do that on my own. I know the law. Oil maintenance is required. Required. And I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I've been putting it off. Like, ah, you know, it's fine. I don't, I drive this thing, I mean, I drive this thing in town mainly. Um, it's a Toyota right now. I'm just kidding. Don't, don't get mad at me. It's, it's an old Toyota. And then I, I start to get used to it, right? And I justify it. Well, I put like really good synthetic oil in it. It's not going to, it's, I mean, it's an old Prius. It doesn't drive fast. It's not like I'm zooming around town, racing trucks or anything, or Teslas. Um, justify it. And things are okay. I'm going to get in it today. When I leave here, it's going to power on. And, the, you know, the gas part of it is going to start. But over time, if you know anything about engines, what happens? It's going to get dirty, that oil. And we live in northwest Iowa. We have to deal with the extreme cold. We, right? We have to put different kind of oil in for the winter. It's just the way it is. They taught me that when I first got here. So eventually... It's going to sludge up. It's, there's, you're going to hear, I mean, the, the engine can seize. All kinds of things can happen because I chose to ignore this warning every single day, blinking in my face. So we, we have to maintain our delight in the word of God. And it, requi it is required. It is not an option. It's required of us and it requires effort. And effort is effort because it is. It's hard. It's a war in our minds every single day, and it's a discipline. And there's consequences that you won't notice until you hear like a knocking sound or a pinging sound in your heart. Maybe like, a, what, is, what was that? What was that thought that just came in my mind? You've been, you've been ignoring the warnings. And we don't notice them until things get bad. That, that's just our way. We can say, well, no, we've overcome that. But remember, only Jesus did. Only he was perfect, is perfect, and will always be perfect. So our nature that we're battling with waits till things get really, really bad before we have this wake-up call. Different levels for everyone. We can't compare. We can't measure. It's just these are hard things. But if we don't delight in every day, meditate on and follow God's instructions, that means actually obeying. Because so many people know the word. It's easy to know the word. We have a lot of teachers. We have a lot of downloads of information. But we don't have a lot of output of that information in how we live our lives. That's the problem. It's TMI without the follow through. Consequence for us is we lose what's promised to us. Those who listen and obey become like the center of the psalm. And this psalm, like many others, is in that chaotic uh, structure. So the middle part out of the six verses, I think, is the most important part. It's, it's the center of the psalm. And it says, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in all that he does, he prospers. When we dwell on the word of God, we bear fruit when the season is right. So we bear fruit on God's time, not ours. He decides. It's not instantly. Read the Bible for 40 days and your life is going to be better instantly. What happens after the 40 days? Three days, that sounds better. I can manage that. It's not instant. It's not, God is not technology or a microwave or whatever. 
convenience we have. He controls it all. He's the vine and the vine dresser as one. So John 15, 1 says, I am the true vine and my father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So this picture of a tree, it's used all over the Psalms. Our roots grow deeper, strong, supplied by nutrients. The, the picture of water, the, the, the word of God, of course, the washing of, you know, cleaning us, our minds, purifying us, and then the Holy Spirit. Our leaves don't wither, it says. That, that means basically you become evergreen. So you're stable no matter what happens. So when you delight in the word of God, it's going to prevent you from being fruitless. It's going to prevent you from falling apart when every stressor in your life hits. When a loved one is sick, when someone passes away, when, when and it, the most horrible thing that you can imagine, it, it's going to, you're still going to have to go through it. You're still going to have to go through it, but you're going to do so nourished, and you're going to remain planted through it. And if I ask anybody in this room, believer who has, because of what you've been through in your life, you have seen the providence of God and the prosperity of God in your life because of how he's carried you through, even though it was difficult, I, I think that you would raise your hand. I'm going to assume that. Anybody? Yeah. That's, a lot, that's a decent amount of hands. Okay. That water is underground. It's in the hidden places of our, heart, of our hearts. You can't see it. And it, it, this river of happiness, this blessed state uh, we long for from God, not out in the things that we can see. When we get, when we get external happiness... Our hearts have, and we're based in that, our hearts have nothing really to, to be nourished off of, off of that, and they're going to fail when things get bad. Or they're going to walk away when things don't go their way. Walk away when it's not fulfilling to us. Right? And we do that in churches. We, we, have, we have like, we have so many, we have, you know, this isn't fulfilling, so I'm going to go try this. And this isn't fulfilling, so I'm going to try this. And whatever it's called, um, church hopping. Right? So without, I mean, if you're searching for a church, I, I get it. You have to go through a process and, and pray and all that. But we, 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 stable is not the name that is put in front of human being in the dictionary. <laughs> I'd say it's unstable. And then when things get bad, we walk away, because, usually because of fear. And in the last days, which we're living in, Jesus said that people's hearts will fail, fail them because of fear with the foreboding of what is coming on the world. The world, for the powers of heavens, will be shaken. But... That was Luke 21, uh, 26. But those rooted in God's words, not in a specific denomination, not in a church body or the type of Bible translation you're reading, they will stand. And, and, and lastly, the psalm says that whatever we do is going to prosper. This, this is what you were waiting for, ladies and gentlemen. It's another verse that's so easily misused. Whatever you do will prosper. What does that mean? Well, you know, I, I, some point someone will say something to you if you're like around churches for any given amount of time and they will say these words, and I used it earlier, well, it's in the word of God. Pastor, it says there, in all my ways I'm going to prosper. Are you telling me that I'm wrong? Well, um, depending on what you mean by prosper, yes. Because you're just taking a verse and using it to make it believe what Make it say what you, you want to believe. Maybe your heart wants to believe if you're talking about that kind of prosper. So basically it doesn't mean you're, it does not mean you're always going to get a promotion. It doesn't mean that you win every game. Come on. But the coach is a Christian and they're all Christians. How come they didn't win? The word is tied to the spiritual blessings of those who delight in the Lord. So prosper, when we say prosper in this context, it's standing firm in trials, loving our enemies, and avoiding enslavement to evil ways. Prosperity is not the world's riches. I'm not saying you can't get materially blessed, but of course you can. But is that why you're here? Is that why I'm here? Our treasure isn't here. Jesus said that. 
And whatever we do in the Lord, here's what prospering is really related to. It's going to succeed eventually and according to his purposes because the word means bring to a successful conclusion to be victorious until the end. Another gospel will teach you that, no, you need to prosper now. Another gospel will teach you, no, we declare healing now. We declare prosperity into your bank account now. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, it's false. It does not work like that. It is not this cosmic genie in a bottle thing where you say the right formula and you get exactly what you want. Or anything you touch turns to gold. That's what that sounds like. And it's a lie that feeds... It's our, we already have a twisted need for fulfillment and pleasure. Why would we do that with Scripture? When clearly... The promise that we have in prosperity is at the conclusion. By the conclusion of our lives, there will be success. In fact, there's success in your life now because you've st- stood firm through some things. And you did so in the Lord. And you wouldn't have prospered if you hadn't gone through that thing. If you had been delivered instantly. Yeah, even in financial struggles, which goes in a, in a, a lot of different paths because sometimes we have caused those situations. And then we need a bailout. And you see the 1-800 number. Okay, he said, if I give to that number, God's going to multiply it because he has the cattle on a thousand hills. And then I tried it and it didn't work. What did I do wrong? Keeping in mind, you still believe in miracles. And I can't tell you how many times the right things have come at the right time. Never to make me wealthy. God knows better. You know, he knows my heart better. I need, to be, I need to be grounded. Um, not that there's anything wrong with being wealthy, wealthy but pff, there we go. The conclusion of your lives will be successful now. It doesn't look like it to those around you. And we're still going to be able to stand when our king comes. We're going to be able to stand in the day of the great day, the day of judgment. And this is what it goes on to talk about. He's coming to judge the world. Evil is going to be purged from the earth. And in him, we're going to remain forever. Because he, the, the, the third thing is, is we're, we're, we're known forever. So we delight in the word and we're planted in purpose and now we're known forever. And Psalm 1, 4 through 6 says, The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind just drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows, yada, the way of the righteous. Intimately he knows your way. He knows you that personally. He knows, I mean, he, it's, it's amazing. He knows what we're thinking right now, what we're, what's motivating our hearts, but the way of the wicked will perish. So this is true happiness. Don't position your heart with this world system in priority, even next week. Don't position your heart. Don't allow your heart to be controlled by anything else but the one who directs your heart in the first place. You're just giving back control to him. You're giving your life back to him. It belongs to him. It doesn't belong to a president or a king or a world leader or your boss or anything. It doesn't even, it really doesn't even belong to your spouse, married people. I love my wife. My heart is yours. Well, yeah, after God. After, after God. You didn't die for me on, and on the cross and Jesus did. Yeah, I love you. You know what I mean? Don't dwell on your circumstances. Um, uh, some this morning, you're still dwelling in your circumstances. You, you cannot stay there. You cannot stay there. I know it's a struggle. I know it's hard. If you dwell in it, you are choosing to sit in a place and be comfortable because that circumstance, what it's doing is saying, Ugh, God's not around all this. You just need to sit here in your mind and wallow in it. And when you're in that place, it is really hard to get into the Word of God. And you usually need someone to come and slap you on the head. No. Uh, Encourage you in the Lord. And this is why we gather. To encourage one another because there's people in this room, in this place, that are, are sitting in seats with scoffers in their minds in circumstances. You have to get out of it. (laughs) 
Meditate on his words. Put them into practice. Don't depend on a Sunday morning service, please, to get into the word of God. We have so much access. We have Bibles galore. Digital, audio. There's VR. Like, I think Life Church and there's churches in the metaverse now. I mean, they're everywhere. There's no excuse. There's places right now you can't even bring a Bible. It's illegal. And we have this word. That's why it's like, does it take loose in that privilege to wake us up? Because I don't want that to happen. I do not. But if it does, we're still going to remain planted, aren't we? We have the word of God. It's not going anywhere. Staying grounded brings blessings and happiness, and you will be planted. And even as the world drifts away, it is going to drift away. It's not going to be completely demolished, but it's going to be like hurt and kind of recreated into something great. New heavens, new earth. But right now we have this to deal with, and the world is going to drift away, and we have to trust in the Lord and trust in his instructions. Now this verse, I'm just going to close with this. It's Jeremiah, weeping prophet, right? Man, he, he was... He got really upset at times, if you, if you read it. But he said this. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water. Sounds familiar. And sends out its roots by the stream, and does not fear when the heat comes, for its leaves remain green, and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. What he prophesied, Jesus fulfilled in a blessed life. That's the life he lived. He lived a happy life, even though he wasn't like a wealthy, materially wealthy king, and he suffered and got persecuted and died for us. Yes, that's right. He was blessed when he was crying out to the Father, saying, this cup, but yeah, let, let your will be done. I, this is hard. He was blessed coming in, and he was blessed going out. That's happiness. We go through fires and droughts, and we can do so bearing fruit, just like Jesus did. What fruit did he bear? A lot. Um, he died and then rose. He died for your sins. Died for your sins, for our sins. He paid that price. Still blessed, mind you. Happy. Was he crying? Was, his, was he smiling and laughing? I highly doubt it, but that doesn't, that doesn't equate to happiness. He rose from the grave. He ascended. True story. I mean, this happened. And the fruit that he both, I mean, really created is and bore, he distributes to us now. He distributes the blessing to us. The blessing is the fruit of the Spirit operating in your life. And you cannot... Um, you cannot just say a prayer and automatically ha whoa, hey, I, that's a miracle. I just snapped for the first time in my life. I just want to tell you that. So, uh, yeah. So maybe I'm, I'm growing. <laughs> Snappily. It's not automatic. And I'm, I'm, good, I'm just going to, we're just going to pray as we close because I know. It, it's not, it's, it's like I say a prayer. Why isn't my life really good? I mean, why, why are things not easy? Well, what are you delighting in this morning? And yeah, just, just let's take a moment of, of, of focus on the master. I mean, we could give him, we can give him a moment of our minds, can't we? Hmm. Yeah, just close your eyes and I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna ask you some questions and you answer them in your heart and you can talk to God about them. Today, where is your delight? What do you long for most, human being made in the image of God, to fulfill you? What do you need to make your life feel whole or happy or things are going to be okay when this whatever happens, whatever that is. 
that is reigning in your heart this morning, if it is not his word and, and your life that you have with Jesus, you have a spiritual symptom to deal with. And we have the treatment. We have the cure. It's, it's, a, it's a lifelong treatment, but it works. And it's guaranteed. And it's the word of God. You have to lay down whatever has been prioritized as your main source of happiness. No one can do it for you. No one's that anointed except Jesus, and he's God. As you ponder that and lay that down, where have you been walking? Where have you been sitting? Where have you been standing? Not physical locations necessarily, although there's probably some places you shouldn't go. But there's places in your heart you have to decide, I'm not going there anymore. I'm not listening anymore. I'm not going to stand in that way anymore. If it takes away from my passion for God and his word, Jesus, I don't want any part of it. And it's one thing to stop doing it, ladies and gentlemen, but you, you have to take in something else, and that's the word of God. And then finally, are you, are you planted in him this morning? Do you feel planted? Do you really feel stable? Or do you feel like falling apart? And you're saying, I can't do it. Well, let me tell you, that's, that's a great place to be. I know it sounds messed up, but it is. You know why? Because that's how surrender happens. Because you're aware of the fact that without him, you're nothing. And he wants to nourish you again. He wants to transplant you into his ways and his heart this morning. And he will do it because blessed is the man or woman who does not walk in that way or listen to that counsel or stand in the way of sinners or sit at the seat of scoffers. And these are the songs that they sung every single day to remind them the promise is you will be planted in him. If that's you this morning, any one of those things. Would you just stand to your feet? Come on. You're already planted. You're good. Stand up. Come on. That's everybody. We're just going to cover everybody. That person who's next to you, standing around you, raise your hands. Come on. Come on. Let's, let's open it up. To Yep, that's cool. Before you leave here, there are people who need nourishment this morning. They need prayer. It, it's not a man of the hour at these special stairs. It's the body of Christ. And someone needs, a, they need a touch from you, they need a prayer from you this morning because we are called to be a, a people planted who delight in his word.